Well, good afternoon again, brothers and sisters. Good afternoon, good afternoon. It's wonderful to see you all. Welcome to another Thursday afternoon webinar. And it is my heartfelt wish, my heartfelt hope, that you have all been having a wonderful week thus far. Whenever we stop to think about it, we can all see very clearly the goodness of God in many different ways in our lives. And I just want to acknowledge that this evening and hope that all of us can say amen to this. So welcome. As always, we're going to start our, our prayer with, um, we're going to start our meeting with prayer. And I'm going to invite you all to bow your heads with me as we acknowledge our Father's presence. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, our God, we're here this afternoon in the name of your Son, our Savior Jesus. We want to start by thanking you for the many blessings. We know, Father, that we are very close to the time when the history of this planet will come to an end. We believe it. We can see it in so many things that are happening. There are so many things that come together to tell us that we are close to the end of time. We thank you for preparing us. We thank you for helping us to keep the oil burning in our lamps in spite of what is going on everywhere in the world. It's our prayer, Father, that as we study together this afternoon, it might be a blessing for every one of us. It might help us to be become more what you want us to be. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so we are continuing our study in the book of John. We have been a long time, well, quite a number of weeks, in John chapter 8. Um, I don't know, it just seems to me that a lot of the chapter is like the experiences are repeated over and over. Very striking, very, very clear message but at the same time, it seems to be repeated over and over as we are going to the, through the chapter. Well, we're almost at the end of the chapter, and I think that um, maybe we might complete the chapter. We will complete the chapter this evening, and maybe even start on chapter 9. But let's go to the Bible directly and see if we can complete chapter 8 this evening. Chapter 9 is... I'm looking forward to chapter 9 because it's a little bit different, and it has some strong lessons there as well. So anyway, yes, John chapter 8, and we're at about verse 50. Last week we read we read verse 50, but um, I didn't comment too much about it, but we're going to continue from there. So verse 50 says, And I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. You see, the thing is that the Jews have just accused Jesus. They just accused Jesus of having a devil. Why? Because Jesus told them, you, are, you do not hear God's words, you do not hear God's words, because you are not of God. I keep thinking, you know, if I said this to somebody today, if there was somebody who professed to be a Christian or a group of people who professed to be Christians who profess to, to be God's people, and I said to them, you are not of God. I might very well get the same answer. I'm not surprised by what the Jews say. You know, probably what we, we should be surprised about is how they were so blinded that they could not see who he really was. You know, even right at the beginning, I'm, going, I, I'm reminded the real underlying problem here is the same problem that has that has continued for generations in all ages with people from different religious groups. You see, the problem was that the Jews the Jews saw the miracles of Jesus. The Jews saw that there was something special about Jesus. They saw that his teaching was divine. It was not of this world. But on the other hand, they believed in their religious organization. This was the real problem. 
they set their religious organization against Christ. And because they had been so brainwashed is probably the right word, they had been so indoctrinated, so in inculcated in this way of thinking, in this way of life. It was their whole world. And that's the danger of traditional that's a danger when tra we, we operate on the basis of tradition. It became their whole world. And so they were so entrenched in this misguided concept that their system could not be wrong. That not even the, the extraordinary life and teachings of Jesus could break them down. And so when Jesus says, you're not of God. I mean, I don't think he was criticizing them so much as individuals as much as he was criticizing their religious system, when he says, you don't understand my words because you are not of God. He was speaking to them as a group, okay? Like he would say, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you are whitewashed sepulchers. He did not exclude Nicodemus, and he did not exclude Joseph of Arimathea. He didn't exclude Gamaliel. You had some honest ones among them. But he didn't exclude them because he was speaking to them as a class. And I think that's what he's doing here. When he says, you don't hear my words because you are not of God. Even though John is referring to them as the Jews. The Jews said, the Jews answered. But it's not all the Jews. It's most of those who are standing before him. And so he says to them, you are not hearing my words because you are not of God. So he's not saying, <clears throat> he's not saying every one of you is not of God. He's saying that as a class, as a group of people, you don't belong to God. <clears throat> I beg your pardon. <clears throat> You don't belong to God. Your teachings, your religious philosophy, your educational system, your, your religious structure has set you against God and you are not of God. So you can imagine why this infuriated the Jews so much because he was actually saying that the Jewish nation, those people that were the children of Abraham, those people who had been given the laws of Moses, those people that had seen God's mighty works in the days of old. He was really saying, you are not of God. <clears throat> was Jesus correct in saying this? Well, the thing is, you can, you can measure identity in two ways. You can measure a person's connection with God in two ways. You can look at his religious system. You can say, <clears throat> you're a Catholic, so you're one of God's people. Or you're a Seventh-day Adventist, so you're one of God's people. Or you're Jehovah's Witnesses, so you're one of God's people. <clears throat> this is the perverted way that the majority of people in the world today look at religious identity. It depends upon which group you identify with. And that's how the Jews saw it. But there's another way that you can look at identity, and it is, it is how the New Testament, Jesus Christ, Paul, uh, looks at rel religious identity. Paul says, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ... He is none of his. You know, this was a new idea with the new covenant. This was a new idea that Jesus was introducing. It was something the Jews were unfamiliar with. It, it only really became established. It only really became understood in the time of the apostles. But up until this point in time, the idea, the idea that you could individually be a child of God where you are was not an acceptable idea. You know, even, even the Gentiles who somehow came into God's, God's salvation plan, who became identified as God's people, even those Gentiles, they had to become a part of the commonwealth of Israel. They had to be circumcised. They had to identify as Jews. So that was the concept they had. And so when, when Jesus says, you are, Jesus says, you can't hear my words because you are not of God. He was speaking to them as a group. He's really saying, there's something wrong with your system. There's something wrong with all of you in terms of your religious experience and attitude. And that's why they said to, the, to, to him, it says, Then answered the Jews and said, Say we not well, aren't we telling the truth when we say that you are a Samaritan and you have a devil? Okay. So I suppose you can understand from this perspective why they say you are a Samaritan because the Samaritans were another religious group. 
as, as I've pointed out before, as most of us will understand, the Samaritans were like a, almost what you would call an offshoot group. There were a group of people who were descended from, from, the Jew, from, from Israel. They were half Israel, but they were mingled with other nations, other, other racial groups. And for the Jews, this was the worst crime of all, to, 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 to corrupt the Holy Seed by mingling with other races. And so they, they saw the Samaritans as dogs and less than human. But there were another religious group. And so when they said, you're a Samaritan, it was the worst insult they could, they could give. You know, so they are really saying, you are criticizing our, our group, our, our religion, our, our, our nation then, our national religion. But you are worse. You are a Samaritan. They were putting him with other group that was, that was held in utter contempt. Not only are you a Samaritan, but you are demon-possessed. You have a devil. So Jesus answers, I don't have a devil. I mean, I don't even know why he bothers to answer that. Because when people make those kinds of wild and, and, and clearly, it's not a serious statement. It's a statement intended to insult and to put him down. And when people insult me, really, I, I don't respond to the insult. But Jesus responds anyway. He says, I don't have a devil. But I honor my father and you dishonor me. So he, he really sets the contrast here with what is happening. The things I'm saying, the things I'm doing, I am honoring my father. And the way you are responding to me, you are dishonoring me. You are, you are rejecting me. You are criticizing me. You are condemning me. And yet I am honoring my father. And you are dishonoring me. So, so you, can, you can draw the conclusion as to who you are. And what work you are about. And that's why Jesus says to them, you are not of God. You know, as he pointed out, your father Abraham didn't do this. If Abraham was your father, you would do the works of Abraham. Over and over, as we have seen, as we have gone through these previous chapters, over and over, Jesus is looking at things from a spiritual point of view. He's saying you are not Abraham's children. Because spiritually, you don't have the spirit of Abraham. Physically, yes, you have the Abraham's genes. Genetically, you are Abraham's children. But Jesus is not looking at genetic identity. That, that belongs to the old covenant. Jesus has come to introduce something different. He's now understanding that they who are of faith, these are the children of Abraham. Those who have the spirit that Ab that's Abraham had, the same kind of attitude and outlook, these are the children of Abraham. He, he, he is introducing a different way of identifying people. And this is where the new covenant begins. You know, every time I hear people talking about how special physical Israel, the Jews, are to God, I think what darkness, what darkness. They don't, they they don't understand Jesus. They don't understand his words. So Jesus says, and I seek not mine own glory. There's one that seeketh and judgeth. So he's piling up evidence after evidence, proof after proof, okay? So, here's another thing for them to consider. I am not, I'm, I, ha, I have not come in the world, in the world I'm not seeking to exalt Jesus. I'm seeking to exalt God the Father. You know, and in everything that he's doing, he's trying to point to the Father and trying to, to show that what he's doing is not he, him doing it, it's not his work, it's the work of the Father through him. Okay, he's, he's pointing direction to the Father and even when he was about to be crucified, he, he made it clear that this is what he was about because he says in, in John 17, I have glorified you on the earth. I, will, I have glorified you on the earth. As it says in, in, in the same book in, in chapter 1 and verse 18, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him or he has made him known. So that was his ministry. He, he was not seeking his own glory. He was seeking the glory of God. I was in a, 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 a I saw a, a, a question on, on Facebook and I responded. But the question basically said, <clears throat> where does it say, where is there a statement that says Jesus was 
God and 100% man. So I responded to the question and I said, well, I can't think of a verse that actually says it in that way. But Jesus had to be 100%, not God, but divine. Because if Jesus was not 100% divine, part of his mission he could not have accomplished. You see, because many people don't realize that a major part of Jesus' ministry that was that he came to glorify the Father. He came to reveal God. He came to make God known. Many people think that Jesus' only work was to save humanity. No, that was, that was, it was important, but it may even be the lesser part of what he had to do. His major work in this world was to make God known, was to reveal God. That is why he could say to Philip, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Have I been so long with you and yet you don't know me? And there are, there are so many verses that point to this reality that Jesus, one of, Jesus' major work was to reveal God. And so that is what he's saying here. I do not seek my own glory. My purpose in this world has been to seek my Father's glory. But at the same time, while Jesus was seeking God's glory, God was doing something for Jesus. He was seeking Jesus' glory. Because look here, you remember where Jesus says, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to me. In other words, God wanted the world to be attracted to Jesus. God wanted the world to pay attention to Jesus. God wanted everybody to fix their eyes on Jesus. Why? Because not only what Jesus was doing in glorifying God, but what he was doing in saving man, the world needed to know about it. Everybody needed to fix their eyes upon Jesus. Because accepting what Jesus did means understanding and believing it. You understand it. You believe it. You see what he did, and then it begins to have an impact upon us, the human race, and also upon the rest of the universe as they come to understand as well. So, as Jesus glorifies the Father, the Father is exalting the Son. Both things are happening. And so Jesus is making the point, I, I am not seeking my own glory. There is one who seeks, that means who seeks my glory, and there is one who is judging. All right? So again, he's saying, I'm not here to glorify myself. You all can stand in judgment on me. You can dishonor me. You can do what you're doing. But there's somebody else who is seeking my glory. And there's somebody else who is judging everything that is happening between you, what you are doing, and also seeing what I'm doing. In verse 51, he says, Truly, truly, it shall be so, it shall be so. I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Ah, <laughs> oh boy, I, I look at this and I think provocation upon provocation. They already hate you enough, Lord. Why are you telling them this as well? You know, I, I think it just seems to me like he's saying things to get them more and more upset. But, you know, it's like I, I think he's saying, well, those of you who will hate me already hate me. Those of you who are trying to destroy me, you already destroy me. But there are some people here who really have a heart open for the truth. And for these people, I'm going to tell the truth and I'm going to tell it more and more clearly and more and more forcefully. And the consequence will be that those who hate me will hate me more. But those who see the truth will appreciate it more. And I love that lesson, you know, I love that lesson because... It's something I need to remember and something I need to live by. Because, you know, all of us as human beings, we tend to be a little bit affected by public opinion, by the way people think about us. And as I look at the life of our Lord and the way he dealt with things, you know, it motivates me. It gives me insights as to how I am to operate as well. Because I also have people who I think are my enemies. At least they are enemies of the things that I teach. And they are very vocal and very forceful and almost violent sometimes in how they attack the things that, you know, we teach. So, the temptation is there as a human being to tone down, to, to, to mute what you are saying, you know, to try to be less aggressive and more pleasing to everybody. But many times that is the spirit of the devil getting to you. 
not the Spirit of God. You know, Satan's ideas getting into your head. Because if you look at what Jesus did here, Jesus didn't tone down what he was saying because of his enemies. He was even more forceful. He was even stronger in proclaiming the truth. Because in every congregation, in, in every place where people gather, there are some honest people. And the honest people will, will take hold of the truth. I remember one time, many years ago, I was handing out some um, tracts about the Godhead. You know, the truth about God. There were three tapes that I, was, I, 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 I did and I was handing them out. And there was a, a, a brother, I call him brother advisedly. There was a person who I thought was my friend, you know, we used to be kind of, we used to, we used to talk together, he would ask me for materials and I would ask him, we, we would share ideas, but just after I came to understand the truth that God is not a trinity, sometime afterwards, I met this guy in town and we started talking a little bit and I started trying to, to share with him about the, the fact that God is not a trinity and I was astonished at how he, he responded. He never, he hardly gave me a chance to talk. He just uh, let out a tirade of words and started abusing me with his words. And I was amazed because, you know, this guy and I had always gotten along fairly well. He used to show a fair degree of respect. But now all of a sudden he was acting like I was his enemy. And he, he, over, he was trying to overwhelm me with a tirade of condemnatory words. I was so taken aback, I could hardly even get in a word. Anyway, at the end. Now, what happened was that I offered him the tapes. I offered him the tapes, and he said, what is it about? And when I showed him the, the title and explained what it was about, that's how he responded. So, after all that was over, I said, okay, no problem, you take care. And I was walking off, and there was another fellow who was standing close by and he said you know of course the person I was talking to he refused to take the tips refused to even take them to even listen to them but this other person was standing there he never said a word he listened to the, 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 the conversation or, or to the monologue from this brother and at the end he says um, can you give me the tips I'd like to listen to the tips and very happily I handed the tips to this other guy so he took the tips the guy I offered them to didn't want it but there was somebody there who had an open heart and an open mind. And he took the tips and he, he, he appreciated them. So that's what I, I, I'm, I, I am saying. You know, <laughs> this fellow who launched into me, who attacked me this kind of way with his voice, I mean, no matter how I had tried to explain the truth to him, it wouldn't matter because I tried to be very pacific and kind and gentle and, and yielding. I tried, to, I tried to be diplomatic. And he, 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 he la launched into me with a tirade of accusing words. If I had responded in the same way, it wouldn't have made a difference. He would not have listened. He would not have accepted what I said anyway. But almost by me saying nothing, the person who was standing there, he heard and he, he asked, for, asked for the tips. So I'm saying this is what I see with Jesus. It, it seems like he is constantly saying things to antagonize them. But I think it's because of this principle. When, when you have people who are your opponents, you don't have to try to please them. When people are determined to condemn you and you see that, you see that no matter what you say, it's not really what you're saying, it's that they hate you. It's not really the way you say it, it's that they have made up their minds. When this is the case, then the most important thing is not how you say it. The most important thing is that you tell the truth without compromising. And this is what Jesus was doing. He was telling them the truth whether they hated him or not. So Jesus says, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Of course, again, he's talking of, about, he's, he's speaking of spiritual things and he's making spiritual points. Now, many people have looked at this and I have even had the question asked of me personally, you know, why did Jesus say this? Because... You know, even today we have Christians dying. Every, every Christian dies. So why did Jesus say, If a man keep my saying, he shall never see death? And of course, Jesus is here speaking of eternal death. Okay, Jesus is speaking of 
not death as a sleep. Okay, you you remember uh, uh, three chapters later on. We'll come to it. But when he when he says to his disciples, "Our friend Lazarus sleepeth," Lazarus is sleeping, and the disciple says, "Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well, he shall do well." And then Jesus spoke to them. It says Jesus spoke plainly, and Jesus says, "Lazarus is dead." So first of all, he tries to speak to them using his 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 normal spiritual mode of, of speaking and, and he says Lazarus is sleeping because he is constantly in the atmosphere of eternity. He's constantly in the atmosphere of spiritual things. So it is it is normal for him to speak in a spiritual way. You know when I was a, a, a young a young Christian and I was going to college there was a group of us there we belong to the uh, we belong to the same day Adventist Brotherhood, fraternity they call we, we call it. But um one of the things that you know we got into the habit of saying we kept we got into the habit of referring to one another as saints and as Israel. You know, it sounded a bit immature um because you know we we were young people and very idealistic, but you know, when we saw one another, how how are you saint or or how are you, Israel? And then we would refer to ourselves as Israel. And it sounds a little bit um, cheesy, maybe. <laughs> but the truth is that, indeed, if you look at things spiritually, that is the way we are, we are identified. God's people are saints. God's people are holy ones. That's what the Bible refers to us as, as saints, not sinners. And, and those who are in Christ are the true Israel. So to refer to a Christian as Israel is absolutely in order. You know, so Jesus was, was doing this all the time. And I, I think I think there's no there's no we we should if Jesus spoke in this way, it's not inappropriate for us to do the same thing. So it's it's appropriate to say our sister is sleeping when, when a Christian is laid in the grave. When a Christian stops breathing, it's proper to say. He has gone to sleep. You know, he will soon be awakened by the life giver. Sometimes you have to speak according to the common terminology like Jesus did with Lazarus. Our friend Lazarus is dead. Okay? But first of all, you understand, he's only sleeping. And to not only say this, but get into this mode of thinking. So of course, the Jews, they are, this is a foreign language to them. Then said the Jews unto him, now we know that thou hast a devil. Now we are certain you are demon possessed. Abraham is dead and the prophets. And you say, thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Now there's another instance where, um, let me see, maybe I should look for this. We have been talking. Maybe it will help if we look at a, at a verse. Um, um, I'm looking for the passage where Jesus says, God is not the God of the dead. Let me see. Matthew 22. Right, look at what Jesus said. Speaking to the, the people who came to him and asked about resurrection, who, who didn't believe in the resurrection. But look what Jesus says. Um... But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So here Jesus taught very clearly that Abraham is not dead, and Isaac is not dead, and Jacob is not dead. Even though all these men were in the grave, for hundreds of years, Jesus said they were not dead. And how does he prove it? Because he says, God is not the God of the dead. God, God is the God of the living. So, when God says, I am the God of Abraham, God is saying, Abraham is still alive. Now, he did not say Abraham is conscious. He didn't say Abraham is conscious. Because Abraham certainly was not conscious. He was in an unconscious state. He was not aware of anything. Neither was Isaac and neither was Jacob. But... God said he's the God of the living, which says that Abraham is not dead. 
in God's thinking, when somebody is dead, is when that person has been totally eliminated. They cease to exist, and that will happen at the second death. But until that time, everybody is just sleeping. So, this is what Jesus means. If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. So, the Jew says, now we know that you have a demon. And uh, they, they dare to ask the question, are you greater than our father Abraham who is dead? And the prophets are dead? Who makest thou, myself, thou thyself? And this is, this is another way of saying, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Because you're saying, here's the, here's the thing that outrages them. You're saying, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Now, clearly, you know, if you said you're somebody unusual, we might buy that. If you said you're a prophet, we might buy that. But when you say, somebody can keep your saying and he will never die, you are making yourself greater than the greatest of our people who was Abraham. And then there's Moses and you are making yourself greater than these men because these men are dead and you claim, to, you, claim you have a greater ability than them. Your word is so important that the person who accepts your word will never die. So your word is greater than the word of Abraham. It's greater than the word of, of Moses and the prophets. These men are dead. And they were, they were the great pioneers of our movement. Who do you think you are? This is their question. And, um, you know, you really have to sometimes modernize the situation to get an idea. <laughs> I don't like to keep putting myself in the picture, but you know, sometimes I, you know, most of you will, will know that I, I come from the background of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Okay, I say I come from that background because I'm no longer a member and I, am, I, I have diverted so far from some of the teachings. I don't even consider myself an Adventist anymore. But one of the things that is always interesting to me is how many enemies I have now among Adventists and why because sometimes I dare to contradict the pioneers of Adventism or the prophet of Adventism sometimes in the things I've come to understand from the Bible I dare to contradict these people I, I remember one person who is my he's still my friend but he was he was a very close friend and I remember one Sabbath I was giving a Bible study and I contradicted some of the revered pioneers, the early Adventists. I, 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 I was teaching something that was contrary to what they taught. And this brother, who, who was my dear friend, and who he had never stood up against me before, he stood up and he gave me a tongue lashing on the top of his voice. I couldn't get a word in. He gave me a tongue lashing because of, of me daring to contradict the pioneers. You know, afterwards we kind of still communicated in a kind of cordial way, but our friendship has never been the same since that time. But it, I, I am reminded of it when I look at um, how these Jews are res responding because the situation doesn't change. You know, people will be your friend. Even even on Facebook, all right, to be perfectly transparent, even on Facebook, there are people who have, you know, sent me friend, friend requests, people who have been my friends, and people who used to, we used to have good discussions in the past, and something has changed, because I started, I started sharing ideas that contradicted the pioneers, and that contradicted Ellen White, and since that time, it's so noticeable. People that used to pass by and say hi, they don't even say hi anymore. And, and if I put up a post, they don't comment. And if, 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 I, I, if I comment on a post, they make no comment. It's almost like they, they, they consider me to be dead. And my great crime is contradicting the pioneers 
of the movement that they, they revere and they look upon as the gateway to heaven. That is the problem. And um, I'm not talking about that this evening, but I, 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 I think about it when I, when I look at what is happening with Jesus. The, 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 the outrage, the outrage is because Jesus dares to suggest that it is possible that he knows more than Abraham and he knows more than the prophets. And furthermore, he's greater than Abraham and he's greater than the prophets because if you believe his word, you will never die. And yet, if you believe Abraham's word and Moses' word, you die. So they don't understand what he's saying, really, but this is their conclusion. And so they say, who do you think you are? Jesus doesn't break it down and make it any clearer for them. He just, he just keeps on going back to the same point. Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. He said it earlier on, up above, he says that, um, that you know, he has said it many times in this chapter, many times in this chapter, that it is not he who is speaking, it's the Father who is speaking, and, um, you know, it is not, he, 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 he is not, testifying of himself. He's not glorifying himself because, where is it? I think a little further down they said unto him, oh yes, you are bearing record of yourself. Your record is not true. And um, we made the point where he says in verse 18, I am one that bear witness of myself and the Father that sent me bears witness of me. So that's the point he keeps on making. The Father is the one who is testifying about who I am and, 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 and what I'm doing. So here he says, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. Look here, if I'm the one who is, who, is, who is trying to prove myself, then you have a right not to believe. But look here, it is my Father that honors me, of whom you say that he's your God. What proof did they have that God was honoring Jesus? The proof that he keeps going back to again and again is the miracles that he was doing, the depth of the words that he was speaking, these were the evidences that he was not of this world. His lifestyle, which of you convinces me of sin? That's one of the things he asked. His lifestyle, his pure and holy life, his words, never man spake like this man, and the miracles that bore witness of his divine origin. These were testifying of who he was, and it was the Father who was doing these things through him. So he says, it is my Father that honoreth me, of whom you say that he is your God. All right, so he keeps going back to that point again. You don't like me, you don't like my teaching, but you have to, you have to think about this. Who is it that is working through me? Who is it that is doing these miracles that you see happening? He's saying to them, have a little sense. Think about what you are doing and think about what is happening. Where do I get this power from? Where do I get this authority from? if God is not working through me. That is the evidence he keeps bringing them back to. And then he says, you know, you say, you say that he's your God. That's a claim you make. Yet, you have not known him. You don't know him. And that's evident, you know, because, first of all, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. But, but Jesus also makes the point that if you were of God, you would, you would love me. Because I am of God. Okay? If, if, you, if you say you love God, why don't you love me? Because I am the image of my Father. Why would you love God and yet you don't love me? It's because you don't know God. You think you love God. But if you know God, you would recognize that God is the same kind of character like I am. So if you love God, why wouldn't you love me? Because like Father, like Son, you cannot love the Father without loving the Son and vice versa. Because their characters are identical. Yet you have not known him. But I know him. And if I should say I, I know him not, I should be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. Again, those volatile words. I shall be a liar like unto you. He's not afraid to call them liars. I mean, even today when I encounter a liar, I don't think it's the most diplomatic thing to label him as a liar. But Jesus was not into diplomacy as much as he was into telling the truth. So 
You look at the contrast. He says, you are liars because you say you know God. If I say I, did, I don't know him, I will be a liar like you. Not that I will believe your lie. It will be that I'd be, I'd, be, I'd be lying. I'd be denying the truth just like you deny the truth. Your truth and my truth are two opposite truths. You say you know him and you don't know him. I say I know him and I know him. But if I deny that I know him, I'll be lying like you because you say you know him and it's a lie. And I would say I don't know him and it's a lie. That's what he's saying. But I know him and keep his saying. And then he, he puts maybe the nail in the coffin. He says... Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. And you know, at this point, we can only conclude that what Jesus is talking about is the events of Abraham's life where Jesus was revealed. Because of course, Abraham, there's no record that Abraham actually had a vision where he saw Jesus but he had encounters with God where God told him of something unusual to come. For example, when God told him in Genesis 18, Genesis 15, Genesis 22 that his seed, his seed, he would have a seed and in his seed all nations would be blessed. That is something that Abraham saw. Abraham did not see it physically but he saw it through the eyes of faith. God promised him he would have a seed. And through this seed, all nations would be, would be blessed. So, so, so Jesus makes reference to this and says, it was Abraham seeing his day. And again, it was it, when, he, when he offered his son Isaac as a sacrifice. Again, in this illustration, he, he saw Jesus in two ways. First of all, in the sacrificing of his son, he came to understand in some way the sacrifice that God would make. But at the same time, just as he was about to kill his son, God provided a lamb. And the lesson was there again in a second way. God provided a ram, a sheep. The lesson was there in a second way. God provides a sheep, a substitute, instead of the one who is going to die. There was Christ for you again. But also the one who was to die and didn't die, there is Christ again. Because it was Abraham's only begotten son. So it was a symbol of Christ in two different ways. The lamb, the, the, the sheep was a, a symbol and the son was a symbol, even though the, symbol, the son didn't actually die. But in these ways, Abraham saw Christ. He saw Jesus' day. He foresaw what was coming, even though his, his understanding was, of course, necessarily very limited. Okay? Certainly he didn't have our kind of understanding, but he kind of got the, the idea. And he believed. So, but anyway, Jesus, when Jesus says it, he's provoking the Jews again. You know, what he's really trying to say is that my identity goes back to Abraham. My, my place in history is so important that even Abraham, the one you revere and you respect and you uphold, even Abraham knew about my coming. My coming is of such significance that Abraham knew about it and Abraham saw it. But this is how the Jews interpreted it. Then said the Jews unto him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? I guess that's how they interpret what he says when he says, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Um... I wonder if there's something else implied in what Jesus says. Let me look at um, the Amplified Bible. In the Amplified Bible, it says, Your forefather Abraham was extremely happy at the hope and the prospect of seeing my day, my incarnation. And he did see it and was delighted. Yeah, that's basically what I explained. That's ex basically what I think it means. But, um, you know, how the Jews answered. It seems that what Jesus says suggests to them that it's not just that Abraham saw Jesus, but that Jesus also saw Abraham. I think that must have been implied in what he said. So maybe the translation is a little bit, maybe, maybe the translation is not perfect. I don't know. I'm just suggesting because why would the Jews say 
have you seen Abraham? You're not yet 50 years and have you seen Abraham? It seems to me that Jesus said something that made them think he was suggesting. Abraham saw my day and I saw Abraham. Something was there in the way in what was said. I don't see it in the translation, but I, I think it's there somewhere. So, so they say, you're not yet 50 years old and have you seen Abraham? And Jesus puts the final nail in the coffin because Jesus said unto them, Truly, truly, absolute truth, unmistakably. I say unto you, I'm telling you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, this statement here is a, is a statement that has, that has been used by Trinitarians over and over as a, as a and they suggest that Jesus, Jesus was claiming to be Yahweh, the I am of the Bible. As a matter of fact, if you look at this translation, the World English Bible, look at the, the panel on the right. It says, most certainly I tell you before Abraham came into existence, I am. Look at the, the, the word am. You'll say they have put it in full caps. That suggests that he's not just saying, I existed. He's not talking about a condition, but an identity. They are suggesting that it means that he is the great I am of the Bible. Let me see if any other translation takes that liberty. Because this is not the New English, the New English translation. No, no, the World English Bible. We saw that already. Okay. The Amplified Bible does the same. The Good News Bible does the same. All right, but that, that, that is a translation liberty that they are taking because the text itself does not, does not merit that. Is Jesus saying that before Abraham existed, I am that I am? Was he really deliberately meaning to take the, the title that God used in Exodus chapter 7, was it? As I said, many Trinitarians point at this and they say, you see, Jesus was the Jehovah of the Old Testament. Now, to be, to be honest, I believe that Jesus was the identity that appeared as Jehovah in the Old Testament. I'll just show you quickly why this is not something difficult to accept. If you go to Exodus chapter 7, all right, it tells you that... Um, It's not 7, it's chapter 4, I think, or chapter 3. Could be chapter 3. All right. Exodus chapter 3. And, um, yeah, here it is. It says, And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am that sent me unto you. Now, the interesting thing is that when you go back to um, verse, verse 2, it says, And the angel of the Lord, the angel of Yahweh, appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. This is the same, it says it's the angel of the Lord, right? And it's this same angel of the Lord who is talking. And it's this same angel of whom it is said, God said unto Moses, I am that I am. It's the angel who carries the title or who makes the claim, I am that I am. Now, even though we understand that this is, this is applying to God, the one God of the Bible, the person who is actually speaking is this angel. And most of us, I think all of us believe that this angel who was speaking out of the bush was actually Jesus Christ, the messenger of the covenant, the messenger of Yahweh, which is Jesus, right? I, I, he's today Jesus. Back at that time, Jesus wasn't his name. But he says, I am that I am. So if, G if Jesus now in the New Testament is actually saying, before Abraham was, I am. If he's saying, I am the same I am that was claimed in the Old Testament, 
I don't see that there's any difficulty because it was a title that Jesus used at the time. And for those who have a difficulty understanding this, let me explain. In the Old Testament, maybe I should show my face for this um, explanation. In, in the Old Testament, there is a device that, is, that God uses. And God wasn't the only one who uses it. It, it was a way of communication through another person. And it happens over and over in the Old Testament. I could, I could look and find quite a few examples for you. You know, today when we talk, we talk about direct speech and we talk about reported speech. And direct speech is, 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 if I say to you, I am David Clayton. And if you take my words and you go somewhere else with it, you will say, he said he was David Clayton. But it, it wasn't like this in, the, in Bible times. You don't carry a person's word like that. The, 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 the third person reported speech. That's not how you carry the message. You take the message and you carry the message in the exact word. So if I say, go and tell Mr. Mr. Brown that I am David Clayton. You would go to Mr. Brown and says, he said to tell you, I am David Clayton. You carry the exact words and you say what I actually said. If I said, I am David Clayton, you go and say, I am David Clayton. And, and so when Jesus carried the message, if he brought a message from God, he spoke as God. He did not give reported speech. And you can see it in many places. When, when the king of Assyria sent a messenger to King Hezekiah, he carried the message. You know, you will read in the Bible where it says many times, and the word of the Lord came. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. The word of the Lord came to, to Isaiah or whoever. It's like the word of God is a living thing and it travels from one place to another. You don't change the word. You carry the word just as it is given to you. Or the word travels just as how it comes from the, the mouth of the originator. So you don't say, God says that he said so and so. You say, God says, or if you, or you, you sometimes you even eliminate God says. Because when the angel comes, he does not say, God says, he says, I am that I am. He's speaking the words of God because he's a messenger of God. He's acting as though he's God himself. So, I don't really see a problem when Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am, because he was the person who was really operating in that identity. You know, but there's also another way in which you could look at the verse. Jesus could just be saying, before Abraham was, I am in existence. You know, you could read it this way. Before Abraham was, before Abraham existed, I exist. He, he is actually putting himself in the eternal present. You could call it the, the present continuous. So he's saying, it's a way of his saying, I've always been there. Long before Abraham. Before Abraham was, I am in existence and I am in existence today. He's really making a, a striking claim for eternity, for, for, for a divine existence, for an existence that goes back beyond the mind and the ability of man to conceive of. What, whatever he means by this, whether he means I am the I am that appeared in the Old Testament times or I have existed from times beyond computation, if that is what he's saying, any one of these, it's enough to give them an excuse to kill him. It's enough to infuriate them to the point that they can tolerate him no more. At this point, they are so filled with rage, like, like, like happened with Stephen. Then took they up stones to cast at him. They said, no, no, this is too much. And they, they start looking around for stones. It says, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them and so passed by. Again, this has to be another incidence of divine protection because they are all around him. I suppose there are many people in the crowd who are not really intending to kill him. But there are quite a number. So, I suppose it was, wasn't too difficult for him to get lost among the crowd. But I think also, you have, a, you have evidence here of a divine protection because it says, Jesus hid himself. It wasn't just that he got lost in the crowd. You know, somehow... A hand of protection was around him and so they couldn't find him. 
And again, it, it points out, it, it highlights the point that Jesus, Jesus was immortal. He was infallible. He could not die until the time came. For, for until God's time came because many times they tried to kill him and they couldn't kill him. He walked through the midst of them and he passed on over and over. But when the moment came for him to die, he set his face toward Jerusalem. You know, that's why it says he laid down his life. He didn't kill himself, but he put himself in a place where they had the opportunity to kill him. He put himself in a place where he was under Satan's power and in the hand of Satan's agencies. And he had to go there because he was the last Adam. And as Adam, he had to take Adam's place and overcome where Adam failed. So he had to be put in that place. But until that time came, until the moment was right, nobody could take his life. And that is a good thing for us to remember, brothers and sisters, when we pass through our own challenges and difficulties. So that brings us to the end of our session for today. That brings us to the end, finally, of John chapter 4. Next week we'll start on John chapter 9 and I think I really look forward to the story in chapter 9 because it's a, it's a very interesting story and there are some striking lessons that we can learn from that story. So I look forward to joining you again next week at the same time as we continue our study in the book of John. So, let me see if I can remember where everybody's from. I'm sure I can't, but I'm going to try. Sister Zadie, of course, from Miami. Sister Destiny from, I think it's Georgia, somewhere in America, right? Sister Destiny, I'm not sure, but I think it's Georgia. And Brother Wayne from Cold, from Cold England. I guess it's the same thing for America, and especially Canada. Brother Warren, from where it's warm down under at this time of the year. Brother Reggie, good to see you, my brother, somewhere up there in America. And I not sure, don't remember the state. Brother Florian from Germany. Brother Patrick from St. Lucia. Brother Matt. And also Sister Amy from up in North Carolina. We are getting blessings, Brother Matt. Here's Brother Sam. Hi, Brother Sam. I think he's in Florida. Where even there is cold, I think, right now. Uh, Sister Angela, greetings and blessings. And um, Sister Angela, I think, is from up in the north of America. I think somewhere up in, up in Oregon or Washington State, I believe. Sister Anita from England, Brother Michael from Germany, Daniel, my neighbor, my son from nearby, just a couple of miles down the road. Sister Chris from Washington. God bless you, Sister Chris. Brother Robin from, Tech, from Trinidad by way of Texas. Brother Terence from South Africa. Sister Pam Pam. This must be Sister Pam from Romania. God bless you, my sister. Brother Alexander from Serbia. God bless you, my brother. Brother Brian from up in Canada. They are cold, cold, icy Canada. God bless and keep you warm, Brother Brian. Sister Loy, my dear sister from nearby, just um, a, a community not too far from here. God bless you, Sister Loy. Brother Andrew from St. James, probably in Mandeville at the moment. Sister Sharon from Miami. Brother Moss Diggity. Hi, Brother Moss. I, I, I am not sure where you are from. But I think I probably should know. But anyway, it's good to see you. Sister Tracy, my Jamaican sister from not far from here either. Good to see you. Sister Vanya from up there in Serbia. Blessing Sister Vanya. Brother Benuil from Indonesia. I think. Is it Indonesia, Brother Benuil? Um, I think I missed the name a little bit. It's not exactly... Indonesia, I think. Is it? No, no. Maybe Indonesia. Another name keeps coming to my mind, Brother Benuil. But anyway, it's great to see you. I know you'll correct me. John 3.16 from Canada. Hello, brother or sister, as the case may be. Greetings up there where it's very cold. Sister Arthia from Jamaica by way of Texas. Hello, Sister Arthia. Blessings too. 
Yes, praise God, Brother Brian. Praise God. He is so good. He always gives us just what we need, just when we need. Hi, Brother Francisco from Panama. God bless you, brother. Sylvie from up there in Romania. Good to see you, Sister Sylvie. Brother Rydell, good to see you also from New York, if I am not mistaken. Yeah, New York, I think. Brother Clito from Costa Rica. Blessings, my brother. Sister Marjorie, my little Jamaican sister from not far from here, out on Spurtry Road. God bless you. Great to see you. Brother Colin from Guyana, by way of the U.S. Blessings, Brother Colin. Good to see you too. Sister Eileen from the Philippines. Blessings, my dear sister. It's great to see you when you're able to join us. Brother Edwin, also up there in the U.S.A. I think in New York, right, Brother Edwin? Good to see you. And Sister Christina from Washington. Wonderful to have you. Sister Nathalie from Texas, down there in Texas, Jamaica, by way of Texas. Blessings. Sister Beth, good to see you. Better late than never. And if I'm not wrong, you're joining us from here. Wisconsin? Or is it Michigan? Somewhere up there. Top things in the world. I know for sure it's the first time I'm seeing that name. Blessings. Glad you're with us. Here, there is Sister Lilla from Hungary. Great to see you, Sister Lilla. Always happy when you can join us. Brother Marvin is here. From up there in the U.S., Brother Owen from Trinidad by way of New York. <laughs> God bless you, Brother Terrence. I am sorry it's over too, but sometimes, sometimes I am a little tired, so I'm glad for the chance to take a break. But, um, Thank you for the word of appreciation. Sister Karina, it's great. I'm always glad to see you. I know we don't get to see you a lot of the time because of the time difference, but it's wonderful to know you can join us on a Thursday. Praise the Lord, and I'm glad it is a blessing. Maria Hrikova, I assume you're from up in Serbia as well. Good to see you, my sister. Albany, New York, Brother Owen, I thought so. And Brother Leonard, um, is it from... Is it from Rwanda? I know it's Africa somewhere. But God bless you. Sister Maria from Belgium. Okay. All right, Sister Maria Hrikova. God bless you. It's so wonderful to have you all. Brother Edwin from Connecticut. All right. Sister Christina from Colorado. I must remember. <laughs> I probably won't, but it's good to see you and to know where you're all coming from. We have a wonderful family. Sister Angela from Alberta. All right, I keep, I keep putting you in the north of America, but it's Alberta. God bless you, Sister Angela. And as I say, keep warm. But I must dig it from USA, from Ohio. Okay, my brother. God bless you all. I appreciate you all very much. Thank you for joining me. And look, it means a lot to me. Keep on coming, okay? And um, let's just close off by giving our Father thanks for the time we have spent together. I love you too, Sister Christina, and everybody else. Love and appreciate you. One day, I will meet you all face to face and show you how much I mean it. All right? God bless you. Let's pray. Thank you, beloved Father, for the time we have spent together this evening. We thank you for the beauty of your words. We thank you for how much depth there is in even, even one verse from the Bible. Every time we study together, we are learning better how to represent how to represent you in the world, how to show your goodness to others, how to relate in different situations. We are grateful, Father, and we give you thanks. We pray now that you dismiss us with your blessing and keep us all safe, keep us all locked into your Son, Jesus, until we meet again. In his name we pray. Amen. All right, God bless you all, and again, thank you for the words of encouragement, Brother Moss. My hearts, the love, everybody, take care. I see you all next week by His grace. Take care.